Hello ladies and gentlemen, Nick here and welcome to my review of the first film I am watching in Theorising Spectatorship for my university uh, module uh, at Anglia Ruskin University as part of my film and me film studies and media studies course, um, second year, fir, uh, second year, second trimester slash semester, um, it's, it's just trimesters now I get um, for everyone now, not just semester slash trimester like last year. But anyway, um, bef before we start, I have no list of what films I am watching in this module because we haven't actually started it yet. It's starting next week um, at time of recording, uh, maybe this week at time of this film of this video coming out. But we were told to watch a film in advance and that is being John Malkovich. So hopefully we'll get a list of films that are coming up when we start, um, we'll definitely probably be told to watch a second film in between weeks one and two of this of the module. It's a bit odd because we usually we watch the first film weeks one to two or in well in the first year it was uh, screenings in the second week. Last semester it was between weeks one and two um, we dropped the screenings and now it's we're doing it a week. The film is in advanced for the week. It's probably because we have a lecture followed directly by a two hour um seminar yeah that was that's um not great timetable planning uh guys um but anyway so being john malkovich had to watch this in advance and to be honest i i wasn't um sure what to expect from it but um because i heard it was a comedy but um didn't know it was a black comedy but going in i wasn't really sure what to expect i wasn't even certain if, uh, if i'd like it it's probably because we had it was because we had to watch the film before starting the module rather than just after starting it um rather than yeah anything else but going into it it was fantastic it was a amazing movie it's a black comedy um but to be honest it has a lot of essence from other genres it's actually very dramatic um, very much like a drama in the first act going a bit more fantasy sci-fi when they find the um, portal that leads you inside the to John Malkovich's mind. And there's a lot of romance throughout the film. And it kind of comes into a bit of a horror thriller, um, action horror thriller in the final act. Um, so there's, qu it's, there's quite a lot of genres thrown in alongside comedy. In fact, I, to be honest, there wasn't, I also have to say there wasn't a huge amount of comedic bits. There was quite a few funny moments, but there wasn't really stuff I would say made me laugh out loud, apart from the bit when John Malkovich went inside his own head, and that was really funny. Very clever stuff. Um, it's not really a film that makes me laugh out loud, but um, it's still got great, quite a few comedic moments. <clears throat> um, the story sees a down-on-his-luck puppeteer, um named i think it's craig um with his pet obsessed uh, wife lottie um he's trying to find himself a job as he can't really get anywhere with puppets in fact on a one puppet street show his puppet shows a bit adult and when a father saw that he was doing one of these adult puppet shows and his daughter was watching it, he was he got a bit cross i don't know why he shouted you motherfucker and punched him in the face as opposed to what a normal pa what a normal parent would say and um and um, well a normal person would probably well they would be shocked but they probably have more of a go at him uh, accusing him of uh, being a pervert or be um to have showing adult puppet shows for, to children or at least telling their kid stop watching it's um a bit too it's a bit too old for you but this what this father was a bit uh drastic maybe the punch could have been saved for afterwards plus <laughs> they, the f bomb is just as adult uh, to his child is just as adult as that puppet show that was going on. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, that was one bit I wasn't so keen on. But, you know, anyway, after that bit, um, Craig finds himself a job at a um, building that has a seventh and a half floor, which is a really tiny floor. That's not really actually explained. There's this whole video thing that's um, video presentation about it. But apparently it's bullshit, according to our another main character, Maxine. Um, so we don't actually find out what the real reason is. Um, unless she was lying. Um, in, that, in that case, I don't know why. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit funny having to see the, all these people, including an, a Octavia Spencer, before she got a bit more recognition later down the line, um, making an appearance early on. Nice. Um, so Craig goes to um, work here and eventually 
um, uncovers um, a portal through an, a secret doorway leading to the mind of John Malkovich. And after 15 minutes, you'll then spat out onto a dish in the New Jersey Highway for some reason. And you just drop out of the air and fall down there. Don't know why, they just it just does. <laughs> um, but anyway, so um, Craig then shows his wife and his uh, tells it to tells about it to his business partner partner Maxine, who he's starting to fall in love with. Um, by the way, Maxine never actually gets to go down the portal. By the way, I think she's one of the few characters we see in the movie who doesn't go into the portal. Um, she's more concerned with John Malkovich himself. Um, and eventually, Lottie and Malkovich becomes Malkovich quite a lot, and gets to sp and uh, uh, Maxine spends a lot of time with Malkovich, with Lottie popping in now and again, and. The two of them ended up starting to fall in love. Well, Lottie starts to fall in love with Maxine, and Maxine falls in love with Malkovich, who also falls in love with Maxine. Everyone's falling in love with Maxine. Are we sure this film's not everybody loves Maxine and being John Malkovich? <laughs> um, which is technically true. Everyone's likes being John Malkovich in this film. Um, so eventually, Malkovich starts uh, noticing something's going wrong, um, and eventually... He finds out about what's going on and enters the um, portal for himself. This is about around the halfway mark of the film. And he kind of goes into his subconscious. And it, that's the funny thing. Um, that was the laugh out loud moment. Um, however, the um, the, comp the people just keep coming in. And uh, Maxine and Craig have been letting people in to have an experience. Um, and they just can, can continue a little bit with... Craig starting to go a bit mad now with his obsession for Maxine and jump and with Lottie and uh, Maxine kind of falling in love with each other with Maxine continuing going to see Malkovich. So Craig goes in and pretends to be Lottie as Malkovich and eventually when Lottie does tell Maxine about what's happening she just continues anyway. Um, it's really fun and it, it, what is a bit strange is that Craig does go a little bit crazy and does kind of sort of get a bit abusive and uh, locks Lockie up, Lottie up in a cage after doing some pretty questionable things to her. I mean, he doesn't really beat her, uh, do too much harm to her, but he is questionable as far as the character is at this point. Um, and yeah, it gets a bit, it does get very dark around the sec in the second hour. Um, as things, as things get a bit more psychological and, um, scary as Craig takes over Char uh, uh, John Malkovich's body, a bit like a puppet, and starts making him do puppetry whilst Maxine continues to do love and affection him. Um, Lottie is able to uh, escape, but um, she goes to see Doc. I think it's is it not Doctor Lecter, Doctor Lecter, um, who is Craig's boss, and it turns out that he is. Uh, there is a guy from. I don't know how long ago, but he's 105 years old at least. He's inhabiting that body, and he and a couple of friends are going to go inside John Malkovich on his 44th birthday, and they're going to live through him. Um, and, yeah, but Craig seems to have taken over this body as he continues to woo Maxine. However, after about seven or eight months, um, Maxine is pregnant, but it turns out she, it's with Lottie's, well, Lottie inside Malkovich, um, which got pregnant whilst Lottie was inside John Malkovich's mind. So technically it's Lottie's and Malkovich's child she's carrying. Um, I should probably point out now that both Lottie and Maxine seem to be bisexual in this film because they're both, they both love men, but they also love each other. So it's kind of bisexual for them. Um, and uh, yeah, kind of, um, the Dr. Lecter and the others are a bit upset about that, so they threaten to they kidnap Maxine and they threaten to kill her. They won't really, but they threaten it. Trying um the Mal Mal well Craig and Malkovich won't call their bluff. Um however Maxine escapes and escapes and Lottie tries to kill her herself um and end up going through Malkovich's subconscious together and eventually and realise the whole child uh, child situation and decide to get together and then Craig eventually decides to leave Malkovich's body to save Maxine, who he thinks might actually end up dead. So Lecter and his pals go inside and take over Malkovich. Um, however, Craig is not allowed to join Maxine and Lottie. And that's pretty much where it ends for him. I think the only other thing is that he goes inside 
uh, he, he stays inside the tunnel and um, as um, Maxine's child, who's technically Malkovich's, technically, but it will be, it's Lottie and um, uh, Lottie and Maxine raising the child. I think it's Emily, her name is. And that's going to be the body for um, the group inside of Malkovich's mind. And he and more people are going to go inside um, Emily's when she's 44. Um, she's seven by the end of the film, uh, six or seven by the end of the film. Um, so still a bit of time to go, but they're enjoying Malkovich's body. Um, and also uh, Charlie Sheen gets a couple of cameos in this film. I think he's towards one in the middle and one towards the end. Um, and I think Craig is also in there, but he's inside Emily's mind already, so he can watch Maxine. It's a bit of a strange ending. I think that's that's what it happened. It's a very strange film. So being John Malkovich, um, some perfect casting, like with Rise of the Guardians, perfect casting with, um, I think, um, John Cusack as Craig and um, Cameron Diaz as Lottie and John Malkovich as himself. I uh, can't remember who played the rest apart from Charlie Sheen as Charlie Sheen. But I think everyone was perfectly cast in the role. Spike Jones, I believe it was, directed this. I might be wrong. No, I don't think that's right. It's, um, was it? I'm not sure. Um, someone. But he does a great job in the direction. That set of the of floor seven and a half is one of the best sets I've seen. That, that doesn't look fantastical or spectacular. It's just a great set. Um, that they could make that just uh, making a half-sized floor corridor and rooms and stuff but it looks great the point of view shots from Malkovich look absolutely stunning and Malkovich himself is really great both as himself and as people inside of him including when he's being controlled uh, he does sound a bit quiet earlier on but maybe that's just him I, I've all, I've only seen three other John Malkovich films um and he's a bit louder more characterizing those um of Mice and Men, which I think gets a reference here with uh, Malkovich apparently playing a retard character, which I presume is Lenny from that film, but I'm not quite, not quite sure. He's got a big Capac catalogue by this point, 1999 already, um, let alone the next 20 years, um, 20 to 21 years. So um, so he could be Lenny, uh, could be, possibly. Um, he was really great in that, by the way. Um, he was, and then after this film, I've seen him in Johnny English as the delicious villain Pascal Savage. That's probably my favourite of his roles so far. He's just so delicious and so hamming that role up. He's just brilliant. And the other film I've seen him in is, um, he's technically the, the voice of Dave the Octopus in the Penguins of Madagascar film. And again, he's, he's hamming that role up as well, but he's really into it. Um, those are the only three I've seen with him other than this one. And in two of those films, he's a bit more louder, uh, louder, more campy, hamming it up villain characters. Whilst in Mice and Men, kind of sometimes a bit loud, sometimes a bit quieter, gent well, say gentle, he's actually quite strong character. But, you know, he was he's a bit more, there's a bit more to him than the quiet, sombre Malkovich of earlier in this film. But maybe that's just Malkovich as he is normally. And then when, he, when things start happening, he gets a bit more paranoid and a bit anger and crosser and uh when people start taking over his body he gets a bit louder and a bit more there's a lot more stuff going on uh for him so maybe that's just how he is normally um or maybe that's how they wanted him to look like to start with and then as things went on um he would um start getting a bit louder and more paranoid and he does a brilliant job in his movie he is brilliant i wonder why they chose him in particular maybe it's because he was a he was a big name star and they could easily get him and they thought it might be a good good stuff um but yeah everyone else like i said is also perfectly cast um brilliantly written script great drama i love i mean it's it's, it's supposed to be a comedy but i love the drama especially in the first act it's just really well done um and also i'm not sure how it all works to, how it all works together but um, the sci-fi fantasy, whatever you call it, uh, whatever you would say for the going inside the brain thing, um, through this portal, um, it, it's pretty, that's pretty cool, that's really interesting, and I like how that's the main point of the film, and it works really well. Um, ending is a bit, it's a bit of a strange final act, and a bit, it's definitely the climax itself, and the very ending, but... It's still really entertaining, really well done, greatly directed, greatly performed, brilliantly shot and cinematography, some fantastic music as well. 
Um, like I said, it's a bit strange, a bit confusing in places, more bit more odd than confusing. It's pretty simple for the most part, but it is apart from a few things that aren't answered, like how did that portal get made? How did, how did Dr. Lector, Lector, whatever, or whoever build that? How did he do that? And how does it change from person to person? That you say is quite odd. Um, it's very strange. And how can people stay in it for longer than 15 minutes? How is Craig able to stay in Malkovich for seven to eight months and even, and then into, into Emily for about seven years? How are, is Lector and the other people able to get inside those heads for years? Uh, it, it's not really stated. And, um, how they are able to, and, and in Craig's case, when he's leaving Malkovich, how is he able to leave it willingly? Um, it's a bit strange. Um, but on the whole, I think the film is brilliantly written and brilliantly crafted together and makes a, it's a fantastic film. There's, it's, it's a bit odd, but it's still, a, it's still worth a watch and some really brilliant stuff. So I'll be giving Being John Malkovich a 10 out of 10. It's an odd film, and there is a few un unanswered questions, but it's still a brilliant black comedy drama, I would say fantasy, adventure, or maybe not too much adventure, but it, it's quite, it's a great film that merges a lot of genres into one film, and it works on most, if not all of them, um, on some sort of level, and just, on the, on the whole, it's a fantastic final product. I think this was the director's um, de de directorial debut, or at least a theatrical film, so it's not Spike, it's someone else. Uh, well, it might be Spike, I'm not sure, it's someone. I was watching it on Box of Broadcast, which is what university students can use, um, and apparently they said, uh, in celebration of his new film, Where the Wild Things Are, which is the, the film adaptation from about 2008, 2009, 10-ish, um, I think this broadcast of this film was about 2009-ish, um, so he, whoever directed that, uh, the 2008, 9, 10, uh, Where the Wild Things Are film, was direct, whoever directed that, he directed this film and it was his directorial debut, or at least for theatrical films. And yeah, he does a fantastic job. So great, I'm glad he got to do, I don't know how much work he di did later on, but I'm glad he got to do further stuff later down the line and got recognised for it. Um, hope the writer did as well because the writing is, or writers and it was because it was certainly a very strong film but anyway like I said being John Malkovich fantastic film and yeah it's just, it's just really great um also I'm, I'm happy to say it came out in my birth year of 1999 1999 was a bit of an odd year for films you got some really great stuff like Toy Story 2 and The World's Not Enough yes I am a fan of that film don't judge me Bond fans but also you got uh, an Austin, Austin Powers 2. That was great. How have you got some weak stuff? Like, I know a lot of people like, um, what was it? It's the, um, it's, the, it's the film set in Scotland. It's in Glasgow, set in 1974, about the bin strike. I um, can't remember its name, but I couldn't stand that film when I watched it. And of course, the first Star Wars prequel film, The Phantom Menace, was a bit of a disappointment. Yeah, 1999 was a bit of a mixed bag year for films. Um... But um, but being John Malkovich is probably the best that one or Toy Story two. Sorry, well, it's not enough. Even though I do love you, um, but um, yeah, this one was definitely a strong year in a mixed bag year for films. The good news is I was born that year, so it's not all bad. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm about as, I'm around the same age as The Phantom Menace itself. But anyway, 1999 mixed bag year for films. Great year for me. Um, and I'm glad that this film came out that year because it's a it's a bloody brilliant film. Um, so anyway, that's it from me. Thank you for watching. Um, and I'll see you guys for whatever comes next in the theorising spectatorship um, module. I, I'm hoping for a film from the 1980s because from the three modules across the two and a half, the year and a half so far across these three modules, like that's theorised um, film studies, uh, film theory introductions to and classical Hollywood. We haven't done anything from the 1980s decades. We've done every, we've done films from, at least one film from 1920s to the 2010s across those three modules, but not apart from the 1980s. So I'm hoping for at least one 1980s film in this module, as well as at least one Bond film, even though I've already reviewed those, but I hope to have a Bond film anyway. And of course, 
at least one Hitchcock. Um, because we should always have Hitchcock. I mean, we didn't have one in the first module, but we had two in the second one, so made up for that. So hopefully we'll get another one here. Um, Bond one's probably not that likely, but it's it's a hope. The main thing is to have an 80s film. That's the main, well, no, Bond's the main one, then an 80s one, then Hitchcock. Um, that's my hopes, but what will it be in reality? Well, once I get the list, I'll let you know in the next review. Uh, until then, thank you for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye. Don't forget to click below to subscribe to the official Nicholas Payne Retro YouTube channel. Um, <coughs> as the deliciously e, uh, um, but I, whoever because I was watching on Boxer Broadcasts um, thing, thing, and apparently it's this guy who. Uh, makes the, um, made the, in, uh, where the, fa And apparently it's the direct, uh, um, on the whole, I think being John Malkovich, yeah. yes, I like that Bond film. Yes, I am a world star enough film. Um, you also got, uh, but, yeah, 1999 is a bit of a nod, was a bit of a nod, yeah.